Good afternoon um, and welcome uh, to the first lecture in uh, our series this term. Um, today we um, will be treated to a Nuke Rigtarink's um, lecture on um, blood diamonds. Now, Anouk investigates the political economy of violent conflict. She's a postdoc, um, postdoctoral research fellow at the Blavatnik School of Government, um, and also at the center for the analysis of natural resource-rich economies within the Department of Economics. Um, specifically, she researches whether and how natural resources, and especially diamonds, are related to violent conflict and the impact of media in conflict-affected um, situations. Um, Diamonds are a rebel's best friend, um, was the um, one way of summing up the belief that valuable minerals spur violent conflict. But of course, her talk will um, show us that it is all rather more complex than that quote presumes. Um, as you can tell from the lecture title, Rebels or Farmer's Best Friend, The Janus Face of Blood Diamonds. Um, we will have about 15 or 20 minutes at the end for questions. So. Um, the, do store those up, um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Anouk. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, so you've already read out my titles, I'm not gonna do it again. And it won't have escaped your notice that part of this title is based on a famous song, Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. It starred in a Hollywood movie in 1953. And back then, the story about diamonds was kind of simple. Diamonds are about glitter and glamour. But if we fast forward about 50 years, Hollywood is telling us an entirely different story about diamonds. So in 2006, the movie Blood Diamond comes out, and it portrays some African country, presumably Sierra Leone and Liberia, and it describes how armed groups are making money in the trade of diamonds and how they often commit a lot of atrocities against the population. So if you haven't seen the movie, rather than me telling you what it's about, I'd like to show you a very brief clip of it. Um, so just to stress, this is a movie, so all of this is completely fictional. Um, I also wouldn't set too much stock by the statistics that are bandied around in them, but it does illustrate a point. So here goes, perhaps. Yes, here we go. Throughout the history of Africa, whenever a substance of value is found, the locals die in great number and in misery. Now, this was true of ivory, rubber, gold, and oil. It is now true of diamonds. According to a devastating report by Global Witness, these stones are being used to purchase arms and finance civil war. We must act to prohibit the direct or indirect import of all rough diamonds from conflict zones. May I remind you that the U.S. is responsible for two-thirds of all diamond purchases worldwide, and I don't anticipate that demand diminishing. We must remember that these stones comprise only a small percentage of the legitimate diamond industry, whose trade is crucial to the economies of many emerging nations. The Freetown government and their white masters have wrecked your land to feed the greed. IUF have freed you, the most slave and master here. It's true, current estimates are that conflict stones account for only 15% of the market. But in a multi-billion dollar a year industry, that means hundreds of millions of dollars are available for weapons in these conflict zones. RUF is fighting for the people! RUF is fighting for Sierra Leone! Any bastard pick he will joke with the diamond and go cut it through. So the message from this movie is obviously quite clear. Rebels are making money of the trade in diamonds, they're buying weapons with it, and engaging in, vi engaging in violence against the local population, which is the big loser here. Um, let me see how we can actually get forward. So diamonds aren't alone in being associated with uh, rebel movements. So this is a picture of a jade mine in Burma for Myanmar, um, and um, there are various ethnic um, um, armed groups who are fighting for more autonomy against the government, and some of these have been implicated in trading jade across the border with China. 
Uh, this is a coltan mine in uh, Eastern DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. Now coltan is a metal that is used in mobile phones and various other forms of electronics. And also rebel groups in Eastern DRC, various ones, have been associated with trade in coltan. So speaking to this issue, my talk is going to be in three parts. Um, first of all, I'm going to ask the question, are diamonds or minerals more in general related to violent conflict? But actually, it turns out that the relevant question that we should be asking is not, are diamonds related to violent conflict, but in which ways are diamonds related to violent conflict? Because it turns out that diamonds can be related to violent conflict in many ways. Some of these ways diamonds spur violent conflict, increase it, but in other ways, diamonds might help us decrease violent conflict. And then, of course, the third point is what is being done to counteract these relationships? What is being done? So I will uh, go over some of the policies that we have so far. And perhaps not surprisingly, if diamonds may be related to conflict in various ways, these policies can also have a variety of effects, some of which we think are desirable, but others we might not, not think so desirable. But first, I'm going to live, give you a little geology lesson. I promise I'll be brief. So uh, diamonds come in two kinds. What you see on the screen now is a picture of a primary diamond mine. So primary diamonds are still embedded in the host rock that they were originally found in. So what you have to do to mine these diamonds, if you have to dig up a lot of rock, you have to crush it. And this is a very capital intensive process and in practice employs very few people. Um, these deposits of host rock are, low, are, are concentrated geographically. So it is actually very hard um, to steal these diamonds if they occur in this form. So it's very easy for the mining companies to protect these small occurrence of host deposits. So these diamonds are not considered lootable or stealable. But because these, uh, uh, these, organiz uh, these um, production operations are big, they're mined by, uh, by big companies, it's relatively easy for the government to tax. So the government captures a relatively high share of revenue. So the diamonds that we saw in the movie are more like these. They're secondary diamonds. They're diamonds that have been eroded away from the host rock, mostly by rivers, and they're spread over a wide range of territory. Now to mine these diamonds, you don't need much more capital other than a shovel and a dish. But these, this type of mining employs a lot of people. It's estimated a million people in Africa. And if we count artisanal mining of other minerals, it's estimated that it's over 5 million people in Africa. Um, so as I said, this is spread out geographically, and that gives this diamond the reputation for being lootable, so stealable by rebels, and then easy to trade across borders. And these operations, because they insist of, uh, consist of thousands of thousands of artisanal miners, are very difficult to tax. Um, so governments typically capture a very low amount of revenue. So two things to take away from this, or actually three things, is that it's the lootability of secondary diamonds that earn them their reputation as blood diamonds. But in this, we ignore that these are also the diamonds that are, are providing a lot of jobs for people. And if we're talking about blood diamonds, we're not thinking about this type of diamond at all. So just to illustrate how big this difference can be, consider the country that is typical primary diamond mining country, which is Botswana and Sierra Leone, which is a typical secondary diamond mining country. Botswana produced over $2 billion worth of diamonds in 2002, but this only employed 6,000 diamond miners, so that's not very much at all. And they're mined by a big international company, Debswana, which is a subsidiary of the Beers, and the Botswana government managed to capture almost three quarters of this diamond revenue. By contrast, Sierra Leone only produced a fourth of what Botswana is producing, but in Sierra Leone, there are 200,000 diamond miners. So it produces a fourth of the value, but it employs 33 times the number of people. Um, and then um, um, these diamonds are very lootable. It's estimated that at some point, over 95% of these diamonds were smuggled across the border. So it's not surprising that government captures only very little revenue, less than 1% of, of this production. So given that we have this little bit of geology, let me skip ahead to the question, are diamonds or minerals related to conflict? Because we have examples of cases in which minerals or diamonds and conflict go together, that of course doesn't mean that the two are related, right? It might be the case that there are just as many countries with diamonds, even diamonds of this kind, that are peaceful. And that seems to more or less be the case. So if we look at this list, 
of alluvial or secondary diamond producing countries, and whether they had a civil war over the period 1992 to 2002, we see that actually the list of countries that has had no civil war, despite producing secondary diamonds, is just as long or maybe even a bit longer than the list of countries that, that, that did have a civil war. Um, we can also make this a little bit more formal we can go and investigate correlations at the country level between whether a country has diamonds or whether it doesn't. And I've lined up here for you th four studies that do such correlations. They correlate primary and secondary diamonds to either the onset or intensity of conflict. And they find either a positive correlation, more diamonds, more conflict, or a negative correlation, more diamonds, less conflict, or no correlations at all. And you can see already from this slide that the results are sort of all over the map. Some studies say, well, primary diamonds are negatively related to conflict, but other studies find that they're positively related to conflict. Same thing for secondary diamonds. This study finds that they're positively related to conflict. This one finds that they're negatively related to conflict. This one finds no relationship. So the results are all over the map. And if we think about these different types of diamonds and the different characteristics that they have, maybe this is not so surprising. These different diamonds create very different realities on the ground, so why would they relate to conflict in the same manner everywhere? So maybe the question that we should be asking is, in which ways are diamonds related to violent conflict? And I, I call these ways, but we can also call these mechanisms. So which ways have we got? So first of all, we have the way that is described in this video and in the quote, diamonds are a rebel's best friend. <clears throat> diamonds are valuable whenever there's something valuable to be found. Some greedy person can be trusted to take advantage of that, even that that means engaging in violence. Um, so um, this is the subject of sort of the greed hypothesis. Rebellions are motivated by greed, which is unfortunately sufficiently common so that property opportunities for rebellion will not be passed up. We can also be a little bit less, um, I guess, sad about the nature of humankind. And we say, well, people rebel for all sorts of reasons, but it's not possible, it's not feasible everywhere. It's only feasible if um, there is some source of financing around. So we're saying, well, we, we, we're, we're, we're passing up, or we're not making judgments about why people rebel, but they rebel only when it's feasible. So if we put this in a very schematic way, we say, well, we have lootable minerals that either increases the profitability of conflict or the feasibility of conflict. And where conflict is more profitable, more feasible, conflict goes up. So if this were the whole story, and especially if ordinary people are a victim of all this, it stands to reason that ordinary people in Africa and elsewhere should hate diamond mining. They should want to get rid of it as soon as possible. But in fact, if you actually go to places with secondary diamond mining and you ask people about their experience, that's not at all what they say. So um, Stephen von Boxtel and Kuhn Vlassenroth have uh, collected a bunch of case studies where people have actually gone and talked to diamond miners, et cetera, and they, they conclude, well, sometimes diamond mining is the most profitable likelihood. These are poor countries, uh, formal jobs, are not available or virtually not available. Um, you can engage in subsistence agriculture, but that's not a very profitable activity either. Plus, you need some money to pay school fees for your children. You need some money to pay medical bills should they occur. And given that these are your options, maybe secondary diamond mining is the most profitable likelihood that people have. So if you ask people in Sierra Leone, which is in 2004, which is not at all that long after the end of the Civil War, um, these two authors go to two secondary diamond mining areas and they ask, well, do you personally benefit from diamond mining? And 36 to 40% of people, not only people engaged in diamond mining, but also others who sell food to diamond miners, etc., they agree with the statement that they benefit personally from diamond mining. Um, also, another study in Tanzania that suggests that people working in mining or related services are less likely to be in poverty than those with other occupations. And also, again, in Sierra Leone, before the conflict, it was said that diamonds constituted sort of a safety valve for young men. Now, obviously, Sierra Leone is very poor. There are only a lot of opportunities. Also, as a young man, you need to attain a certain economic status before you can marry. 
uh, that means often obtaining land, but in traditional communities, land is often beholden to the older generation, so it's, 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 um, it's hard to come by. So these mill youths are frustrated, and diamond mining was one of the few opportunities where you could get that economic status. Um, so it does seem that this story of greed and feasibility isn't the only story that might be out there. Maybe one of the stories is that if there is minerals that are very labor intensive that provide a lot of jobs for people, this might improve their livelihoods. And if their livelihoods are improved, it sends the reason that perhaps they're less vulnerable to recruitment into an rebel army. Certainly, um, just before the conflict in Sierra Leone broke out, the Sierra Leone government expelled a lot of miners from the mining areas. And these young men certainly pr proved a very fertile recruiting ground for the RUF, the rebel movement. So if people's vulnerability to recruitment goes down, or, um, and if um, the cost of recruitment go up, it stands to reason that there might be less conflict. So this is another way or another mechanism in which minerals may be related to conflict that maybe has been underemphasized. Another thing to consider is the government. And as this picture illustrates, the government may be both the problem and the solution. In the case of minerals, at least in sort of the public discourse, the role of the government has been ignored a bit. We've been all been talking about these secondary minerals, these losable minerals, and we have ignored the fact that governments are often uh, deriving a lot of revenue from these minerals as well. And in the case of oil, we've all been thinking about how governments that get a lot of oil might be more corrupt, they might repress their citizens more, it might be bad for economic growth, etc. And it could be that the same mechanisms hold up in the case of minerals or diamonds. So if we are now forgetting about these lootable and labor-intensive secondary diamonds and we're moving on to the taxable primary diamonds, what may happen if, that there, if there's, the government is sitting on a big sack of money from taxable minerals and if it can dispense this at its own discretion, what may be happening is that it becomes more interesting to become the government, to be the one that is sitting on top of that sack of money and maybe be able to redistribute some of the money to your own group, or maybe even put it in your own pocket in a nice Swiss bank account. So if the price of government, if there is a higher price of government, it's then to reason that it's possible that conflict might go up, that more people would try to overthrow it violently. On the other hand, if a government gets more taxable minerals, this might also increase the government's ability to pay for an army. So the, their capacity to repress the population. And although this might not be a very desirable outcome, that may mean that conflict is less likely. On the more positive side, if the government gets a lot of money and it does actually good things with them, if it delivers more public goods, which improve people's livelihood, decrease people's frustration, we may think that conflict goes down also. So what determines whether which of these sort of channels gets set into motion? Well, I think it is um, um, thought that a lot of the answer to that depends on institutions. So institutions is a very shorthand way of saying the extent to which the government is constrained in what it does. So if the government is unconstrained in taking the prize of natural resources and distributing it at its will, we're a lot more likely to get this outcome. If the government is unconstrained in how much they can spend on the army, um, um, we're more likely to get this one. But if the government is constrained in ways we think are desirable, maybe, oh, maybe what we get is the lower outcome. So anyway, in our quest to find out whether um, diamonds or minerals are related to conflict, we're now in a bit of a pickle because we have so many ways and so many pathways. And um, some of these might be applicable in some contexts and not in others. Some of these might not be applicable at all. But in other contexts, two of these paths or two of these mechanisms might be applicable all at the same time. If we think again about the diamond, uh, the, the movie we saw at the beginning, for example, we are seeing a mineral that is both lootable and labor intensive. So in the case of Sierra Leone, we, stand, we, we tend to think that these these two top mechanisms, the greed and feasibility one and the livelihoods and vulnerability to recruitment one, might be in play all at the same time. And they're working in opposite directions. This one increases conflict and this one decreases it. 
So the question is, in this fight between these two mechanisms, which mechanism is stronger? Which one is dominant? That is, of course, a question for empirical research. And I can't answer this question in general, but I can show you a little bit of my own research, um, which um, shows this for some, or investigates this for some cases. So let's return again to the case of Sierra Leone, because Sierra Leone is the, con the conflict that is supposedly motivated by diamonds. So this is a quote from a UN representative that says the root of the conflict in Sierra Leone is diamonds, diamonds, and diamonds, meaning rebels are motivated by diamonds and having very much this top mechanism in mind. But let's look at what actually happened in Sierra Leone. So this is a map of Sierra Leone. Here on the left, we see Freetown. And these sort of turquoise lines are rivers that are um, known to be carrying diamonds, or that are expected to be carrying diamonds. So Sierra Leone is being overlaid by a grid, and this grid is colored by how many violent events are, have taken place in Sierra Leone in 1991. The darker the color, the more violent events. And this moment in 1991, the diamond price index is 110, so the diamond price is relatively high. And what we see in Sierra Leone in 1991 is exactly what we would expect if this conflict was all about diamonds, right? All the violence is in the diamond-rich areas, and there's very little violence anywhere else. But let's now skip forward to 2005. Now the picture becomes more complicated, right? Um, the, um, the, the violence is now more intense in a lot of areas that don't have any diamonds at all, and in fact, in 1995, the RUF, the rebel movement, got within 30 kilometers of the Sierra Leonean capital of Freetown. Um, so um, there, are, and actually, at this moment, the diamond price is rather low. The diamond price is about 20 points lower than in the previous picture I showed you. So there are three things puzzling about this picture. A, if the rebel movement, the RUF, was exclusively motivated by diamonds, why did they move towards Freetown at all? Two, um, why, if it is true that the RUF was getting stronger by the sales of diamonds, why are they moving towards Freetown at a moment when the diamond price is very low? If anything, they should move towards Freetown when the diamond price is very high, if they're really driving revenue to buy weapons, etc. And then thirdly, you might not have noticed, but the scale of this violence measure has changed quite radically. So overall, there is now a lot more violence in this picture than in the last one. So if it's really true that diamonds cause violence, we would expect more violence at a time when the diamond price is high, whereas in fact, we're seeing more violence at the, at the time when the diamond price is low. So just the greed and, and feasibility mechanism, just the idea that this conflict is all about diamonds and about nothing else, doesn't explain this picture. In order to explain this picture, you have to combine it with the idea that says, well, this moment, the diamond price is very low, meaning people's livelihoods are at risk or they're lower than they used to be, so they're more at risk to recruiting, so the RUF has an easier time to recruiting and therefore has an easier time fighting the government. So you can make this more formally by not just considering Sierra Leone, but considering all African countries, overlaying them by the same grid, investigating whether they have diamonds or not, counting how many violent events they experience, and doing this for a number of years, 2005 to 2015, and see if the diamond price goes up, what happens in countries, so countries as a whole, but also in these little grids, that have secondary diamonds. So the conclusions from my analysis are the following. If the international diamond price increases, we see a decrease in violence countrywide in countries with secondary diamonds. So this is the same as we saw in Sierra Leone at a moment when the diamond price was very high, there was low violence, but at a moment when the diamond price was very low, there was a lot of violence. And this is consistent with this mechanism, thinking that diamonds provide livelihoods for people, and that if their livelihoods are at risk or their livelihoods are decreasing, they're more at risk of being recruited into a rebel group. However, the story is not all uh, roses and moonshine. 
Um, an increase in the international diamond price is also related to a concentration or an increase in violence in regions that have these secondary diamonds. So overall, the country is benefiting from the high diamond price, but the regions that actually have diamond, secondary diamonds don't necessarily. And this is consistent with this idea that there is a lot of, that, that dim, secondary diamonds might be subject to looting. So um, I guess in this case, if we think back to my, to these two stories, greed or feasibility, livelihoods and vulnerability to current improvement, I can see evidence for both of these in the context of Sierra Leone and in the context for Africa. But at the country level, this one seems to dominate, seems to be stronger. So now the question is, of course, what is being done? And if you're really ambitious, has this been successful? So at the beginning in the movie fragment, you heard someone say, we should ban all diamonds related to rebel movements from the market. So an attempt has been made to do just that. So in 2003, we got the Kimberley Process Certification Scheme. This is a, a treaty between countries. And all countries that sign this treaty commit themselves to not trading any diamonds, importing or exporting them, unless they carry this certificate. And this certificate states that the proceeds from the diamonds have not been used in a conflict against legitimate governments. This is a contract between states. Um, you can also put this onus on companies. So this is a picture of Donald Trump, and he's holding the executive order to revive the Dodd-Frank Act. So the Dodd-Frank Act is a lot of regulations relating to companies, but the Dodd-Frank Act section 1502 specifically requires companies um, to um, go through a due diligence procedure to make sure that the raw materials that they're using in their products are not mined from rebel-held mines. Um, so obviously this is now a revision and who knows what happens. So in a way, these policy options seem very morally right. Of course we should ban diamonds that have been in the hands of rebels from the market. Right? Of course we should, ensue, uh, uh, we should uh, inform consumers about the products that they're buying. But it's also possible that there's a lot of collateral damage from these policies. And again, think about that a lot of secondary diamonds provide livelihoods for people. So consider the case of Ghana, for example. At one point, Ghana was banned from trading diamonds by the Kimberley process because they were afraid that Ghana was laundering diamonds from Liberia. Later, this turned out not to be true, but nevertheless, Ghana was banned from exporting diamonds for a while. And uh, Gavin Hilson and his co-author has done research in diamond mining areas of Ghana, and they've looked at what happened, and they have observed a chain of events where small-scale diamond miners get deprived of their livelihoods, the local economy completely collapses, the restaurants that serve food to miners close, the, trend, the people providing transportation to miners close, the people that sold them, things in shops close, and that an entire town is basically plunged into poverty because of this. Another reason why the Kimberley process specifically might have um, undesirable side effects or sort of collateral damage, if you will, is because the Kimberley process presumes a diamond guilty until it is proving innocent. So a diamond is a conflict diamond for all intents and purposes unless it carries this certificate that you saw at the beginning. So a diamond is proven guilty, is guilty until proven innocent. But in order to have this certificate, you have to be a formal miner. And if, in order to be a formal miner, you have to get licensed. And getting licensed is expensive. So in Liberia, for instance, the official price for a miner's license is already $300. We're talking about a very poor country here. And in practice, if you count every, all the expenses that you have to make to get it, it's between, between four and, $400 and $600. So the majority of the poor, the, the, a lot of poor miners cannot afford these licensing fees. So unless they can somehow whitewash their diamonds and smuggle them into an official channel somewhere, which would mean which means they're selling them at a discount, their diamonds are going to be not carry the certificate, so for all intents and purposes, going to be blood diamonds. Um, so you might say, well, you know, no policy is perfect. Maybe all the benefits that these policies are doing outweigh all this collateral damage, which may absolutely be true. 
There have also been studies of the effect of the Dodd-Frank Act, which investigate this specifically. Um, so uh, the Dodd-Frank Act has, has especially affected uh, the trade in coltan from the DRC, which again is this metal that is found in your phone. So this is what these authors do. Uh, Parker, all you can look at the paper. Um, they compare mines that are very close to the policy zone of the Dodd-Frank Act. Essentially, these mines are ba banned from trading to mines that are also in Congo, but outside the policy zone of the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, so it is um, the straight line, actually these authors have made a mistake in their sign, so it's the dotted line that is the mines that are banned from trading, and the solid, mine, the solid line are the lines that are not banned from trading. And in 2009, the Dodd-Frank Act kicks in. So we see that before the Dodd-Frank Act kicks in, um, and sorry, the other axis is infant mortality. So it's under one infant mortality, which you can see is importantly rather high in the Congo. Um, before the Dodd-Frank Act kicks in, these mines that were banned from trading eventually, and the mines that were not banned from trading eventually, did approximately the same in infant mortality. But then the Dodd-Frank Act kicks in, and the mines, uh, the that are incorporated in the dotted line are banned from trading. We can see that the mines that are not banned, they are, oh sorry, I'm doing it the wrong, <laughs> I see I'm doing it the wrong way around. It is, um, sorry. So let me start this again. This axis is infant mortality rate. 2009 is the, is the moment when the Dodd-Frank Act kicks in. The solid line are the mines that are banned from trading. The dotted line are the mines that are not banned from trading. Before the Dodd-Frank Act kicks in, these mines were doing sort of similar. After the Dodd-Frank Act kicks in, we can see that the mines that are not banned from trading, dotted line, decrease their infant mortality a lot. Why is this? The price of coal tan is rather high at this moment, right? And these, these, the households in these areas are apparently making use of the higher price of coal tan to improve their livelihoods, perhaps pay medical fees for their children, mothers are in better health, etc., to decrease infant mortality quite sharply. However, in the mines that are banned from trading, who cannot take advantage of this uh, increase in the price of coltan, we can see infant mortality trending up. So basically, what this is saying is, and the authors investigate also the effect on violence, so they are saying, well, the, um, the Dodd-Frank Act had a very small effect on violence. You can see that there is slightly less violence in, my, in the vicinity of mines that were banned from trading. But this effect is completely swamped by what we see here, the effects on infant mortality. So if we're just looking, say, if it were to be possible to compare life for life, they're saying, well, any life savings that are accomplished by diminishing violence around the areas of mines may well be completely swamped by any life losses from, that are results from loss of people's livelihoods and just that effect on infant mortality. So anyway, this is a long-winded way of saying that yes, these policies that we're talking about, the Kimberley process, the Dodd-Frank Act, they may have collateral damage and actually in some cases, this collateral damage may outweigh the benefits that these policies may be uh, achieving in terms of decreases in violence. So the question is then, oh, and then a third thing that the Kimberley process doesn't really take into account. The Kimberley process is essentially sort of agreed on by people sitting around this table. So this is a screenshot of the movie we saw. So not necessarily by the G8, but the people who are sitting around these tables, who are they other than white men in suits? These people are leaders of countries. So under the Kimberley process, it is essentially countries, states, who are determining what is a blood diamond and not. So states, if they wanted to, they could take all the revenues from diamonds that they get and put it into arms and put it into their armies, but that would not make the diamonds that they are selling, they are mining, and they are giving certificates to any more conflict diamond than anyone else. So 
if these policies might have collateral damage, and this collateral damage may, may even outweigh any benefits, what else can we do? So we should realize that a lot of these policies are sort of addressing this top mechanism, which is the one that is utmost in people's minds. But they may be forgetting about the, the, the bottom two. So if we're thinking about making um, labor-intensive minerals work to reduce conflict, maybe what we should be doing is strengthen this link between labor-intensive minerals and people's livelihoods. Or alternatively, if we worried about the government and what providing a lot of um, tax revenue, discretionary tax revenue may do to governments, maybe what we should be doing is improving these institutions to make sure that this taxable minerals revenue goes into delivering public goods rather than into anything else. Um, so two alternative um, interventions that have been tried but have been successful to a varying degree. For example, is the Diamond Development Initiatives, which is an initiative in Sher that was tried in Sierra Leone but failed, unfortunately, and I can go into that a little bit more. But it was intended to strengthen this link between diamonds and livelihoods and to essentially provide a ceiling, like some other fair trade initiative, provide a ceiling to the price that um, a secondary diamond miners could get. Um, so basically ensuring diamond miners a fair price for their diamond, even if the international diamond price is low. Another alternative, for instance, is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which is um, an initiative to um, improve exactly these institutions, these constraints on governments that we were talking about. So basically the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative um, requires governments to publish and be transparent about what they do with natural resource revenues. Um, and um, they require them um, um, to be transparent with the idea, of course, that they will then be pressured by various democratic processes, hopefully, into spending the natural resource revenue on um, improving public goods rather than any of these things. So these are just two things, two thoughts about alternative policies that may not be as flashy as the ones that were set out in the video, but that may be um, alternatives to things like trade bans. So I think I'm even ahead of schedule in thanking you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Anouk. Um, we have a roving mic, um, so uh, please wait for the mic to get to you. But do be aware that this is being filmed and broadcast, so only ask a question if you're happy to be live on the web. Um, so if we can have any hands for the question. Do you have a mic? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Anouk. It occurred to me... Um, seeing um, the correlations which you showed there. Um, have you considered um, the possibility that there might be some time delays or lags in these effects between, for example, the price of diamond and, um, you know, procuring weapons uh, <coughs> and um, better livelihoods? Is there a sense in which um, <coughs> tracking one parameter, there's a delay in its effect on other parameters, so that perhaps the cause and effect isn't immediately obvious, but is nonetheless there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Should I ask another meeting? Yes. Um, I can, of course, speak best to my own study. Yes, this is definitely the case. The impact of livelihoods might be faster, perhaps, than the impact on violence, because you have to procure weapons, etc., etc. Um, I'm not sure that is entirely the case, because the impact on livelihoods may also be delayed, because these diamonds are, of course, traded through trading networks, and the international price might not immediately have an effect. And unfortunately, often procuring weapons in these circumstances is often rather easier than we would like. And regardless, you can rerun this analysis and try different lags of diamond prices. So you can try one lag, two lags. These are result, the results that I showed you are lagged once, but you can do it lagged 
another time and then lag through three times and you get the same thing. So, um, yeah. Uh, John Bond, uh, you, you haven't mentioned, uh, well, I, I know a fair amount about Zimbabwe and the way where the government um, moved in to the diamond field there in the northeast of the country and uh, very violently uh, to take control of the mine there and 200 people died at the hands of the military in order to the government to take control and then used all the money themselves. You haven't said anything about how you deal with that sort of situation where it's not rebels but government that is stealing the diamonds. Can you say anything about it? Yes. Um yeah, and I think um, you, ha you have me a bit of a disadvantage because you sound like you're more of an expert in Zimbabwe than I am. But um, I completely agree that sort of this, the idea that government can also be very violent and that this can also be related to natural resources, specifically minerals, has been um, overlooked in the policy world. Um, it is really hard to think what we should do about this. Um, uh, people have been thinking about it more in the case of oil. So if you read, for instance, the book Blood Oil by Lee Wiener, he is a very strong advocate for saying, well, um, as an international community, we should be very principled and we should say, well, if a government is not democratic or even violent, it should not have the right to trade its country's natural resources on the international market. So we would um, we would have to we would have to have some sort of ban on diamonds that are, for instance, obtained through the Zimbabwean government. Um, I'm not quite sure what I think of that. Um, I am again thinking of, well, how long will it really take to sort of starve out the Zimbabwean government through trade bans? They haven't been proven very effective in the past. They haven't been proven very effective in the case of Iraq, for instance. Um, so I'm not sure, but some people should say, well, we should be very principled and, and, and close the international market to governments like Zimbabwe who are taking that sort of action. Thank you for your excellent lecture. Um, rare earth metals, is that what they're called? Rare earth elements? Um, sure, yeah. Are they figuring in the consideration of these other uh, sort of blood diamonds, because rare earth elements, or whatever they're called, I believe are used extensively in the, the um, development of mobile phones. So it, it's a very current issue, a very important issue. Are all our energies going into dealing with the problems of, of diamonds when they should also be taking account of rare earth? elements. Um, yeah, I think um, that is a very apt remark. Um, I think coltan is one of these uh, rare earth methods that you were speaking of. Um, I think you're absolutely right that in some sense there is a lot of similar dynamics that are going on around coltan because they're also, it's also relatively lootable um, and certainly very, very, very labor intensive. So a lot of the same dynamics that are going on around secondary diamonds may be going on around uh, coltan as well. Are we putting all our energies into diamonds, whereas we should be putting them sort of in some sort of broader initiative? Provided that we can come up with an initiative that is effective, yes, that would be nice. There's of course a reason why we were successful as an international community in getting to the Kimberley process for the case of diamonds and not so much in other cases. Um, the the international diamond market is very concentrated. So there's a, there's a big monopolist, the beers, and it's very easy to get them around the table. So it's very easy to get the entire diamond industry around the table and agree to things. Um, also, I think there was some sort of momentum in around the movie Blood Diamond, etc. in uh, international, well, not around the movie, but um, there was sort of momentum in international advocacy circles um, to get to an agreement in the case of diamonds. Um, so there are reasons why it was easier for diamonds, I suspect, than it will be for rare earth metals. But yes, it would make a lot of sense to broaden our efforts 
provided that we can find an effort that is effective to more than one mineral at a time, because if we have to arrange all these things on a case-by-case -case basis, that seems an inefficient thing to do. So uh, one of the countries that seems to invest in institutions and infrastructure in Africa in a very, very big scale is China. Do you think that mm. China will have a beneficial effect um, on the problems you've described here? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I think I'll stick with the go-to academic answer and say it depends. Um, but I think it will depend on, on a number of things. I think it will depend on the extent to which investment of China in minerals in Africa really does provide these local links to other local companies, but also employing locals. China is often accused of only employing Chinese. Um, I'm not sure that is always true, but let, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on this issue. I think it will also depend on the extent to which um, any investment in China is undermining any local institution. So say, I'm not, I'm not at all saying that this is the case, but say these investments are taking place in sort of shady legal environments, people may be bought off here and there, then I don't think that that might be a good thing for conflict. Um, so it will depend on that as well. Um, infrastructure, well, whether more or less infrastructure will lead to more or less conflict is an entire um, entire field in itself, and I think that can have many unexpected effects. It's easier to move around for the government, might be easier to move around for the rebels, but infrastructure may provide people with livelihood, so that's an entire other can of worms there. So it depends. Anouk, thank you for, for your lecture. I'm still trying to get in my mind where does some of the evidence that you have unearthed take us in terms of what to do? <laughs> and you've taken the spotlight to the impact on local people and the correlation between conflict and so on. At the same time, um, I'm sure in your own mind you've already thought through. So is Kimberley, um, in a sense, the wrong approach? Or does it have unintended consequences? Or are you suggesting that the extractive industry uh, transparency initiative is a better way to go? Where does this lead to? And the second question is, by looking at things like child mortality, for example, or infant mortality, you have not covered today the overall cost, uh, in the broader sense, of conflict to a country. I mean, a civil war may, in certain areas, increase income <clears throat> for people who were very poor by being able to trade diamonds in, in the absence of government, you know, reaping all the revenue. But what is the price of conflict for a nation over the long term? Um, because ultimately, I assume you're doing this research to help the world understand what does it do in a moment of conflict where a natural resource, or a, you know, let's say diamonds or rare earth, become either a driver or a financing source that <clears throat> sustains conflict? Or can it be used to reduce conflict? And uh, it would be interesting just to see do you have conclusions already, or is that where you're heading with the research? Thank you. Um, yes. I would be hesitant to say that the Kimberley process is the wrong thing to do, because unlike um, the people whose graph I put up in the case of the Dodd-Frank Act, I, haven't, I don't see a way with my data to do sort of this cost-benefit analysis about how many lives are lost in violence versus how many lives are lost through reduced uh, livelihoods. So I'd be hesitant to say the Kimberley process is the wrong thing to do in a, in, in, in a lot of cases, informing the consumers about what they're buying. Well, that has to be a morally right thing to do as well. Um, but I do have very serious, um, I do have very serious reservations behind what the Kimberley process is doing. But of course, there may be a lot of ways in which we can make, even with or without the Kimberley process, we can make um, a diamonds work for people on the ground. I mean, for one, we can make it easier for them to get licensed, right, at a lower cost. That would be one um, that would prevent a lot of collateral damage, for instance. Um, wouldn't it be lovely to see some sort of fair trade market for diamonds, if, as we've seen in bananas, etc.? 
Um, it is interesting that in a world where it becomes more interesting to buy local, to know where the cow comes from that your burger got made of, to say, oh, I'm buying this water, but with this water, I'm giving 10p to creating a water well in Burma or something along those lines. In a world where that seems to be very marketable, in terms of diamonds, it is now De Beers, a very big international diamond cartel, who is, who is, who is saying, oh, our diamonds are guaranteed pure and conflict-free, and we're inscribing them with a micro mark that guarantees you that. It is actually, in this case, De Beers who is, who is cashing in on them being conflict-free. Whereas if I had to wear a diamond on my finger, I might rather have one that is mined in a fair tree way, fair trade way, providing school fees for a farmer's daughter in Sierra Leone, than one that is providing revenue to the beers, which I personally care nothing about. So I think there, there, are, there are many ways. Um, you're saying, well, to what extent does infant mortality uh, capture the overall cost of conflict? Well, no, of course it doesn't. It's only a proxy. But in a way, if only infant mortality decreases, already outweigh any gains that we're making in terms of violence, then if we're heaping in more costs of conflict, then of course that outweighing is only becoming more serious. Um, um, oh yeah, and then you say, oh, maybe civil wars may increase income for some. I didn't mean to suggest that um, people are deriving revenue from diamonds specifically during conflict. In fact, I think ordinary miners uh, may suffer from conflict uh, as, as we might expect them. But in peaceful situations, I do think um, um, that mining can be a relatively good thing for people given the other options that they have. I'm not an expert at all on this uh, subject, but I have been doing it with my students in class in an international college in Oxford just recently, so I have sort of probed some of the questions myself. I mean, the thing I started with my students was sort of looking at the uses of diamonds. And, and though we tend to think of them as being about jewelry and everything else, and we know there are industrial uses, but they're also part of the kind of, you know, war industry as well. They're required to make planes, to make, make other kind of weapons. So obviously they're very valuable kind of resources to, for example, the developed world, as, as, as well as sort of local um, conflicts in the kind of area. Accompanying the film Blood Diamond was an excellent documentary made by a Sierra Leonese um, journalist, um, Soria Samura, who was recently also presenting you know, his film in Italy um, at a, a sort of documentary kind of festival. And he um, thought the Kimberley process itself was imperfect, but it was the best kind of thing they had. Um, he highlighted the poverty of the people that tends to come from, well, I suppose you have to go back to colonial roots, yes, so there's a presence of, of <laughs> colonizers, plus then corrupt government, and then also the rebels who at some stage are sort of seen as kind of rebelling against colonialism and their government. So you have quite strong kind of power conflicts going on there. Um, I think at one point you said that when livelihoods from, I, I think people sort of generally were presented as being between a rock and a hard place, that often people were having to work in the mines because starvation was forcing them. They were facing corruption from officials who, you know, in order to get licenses, you have to pay small ting and you have to pay lots of money to get that. Um, you have to pay protection money to sort of armed guards and various others. Um, so, you know, the people situation described by this uh, reporter was very desperate. And I think at one point you said something about, you know, recruitment being less when people's livelihoods were stronger, but it's not exactly voluntary recruitment, is it? It's more a sort of coercion where people were, you know, violently Attacked, you know, hands hacked off. You know, it, it is. Can, can, can we, if we let Luke respond to that? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yes, there was a lot in there. Um, first, he said um, um, different uses of diamonds, parts of diamonds used in the war industry. Yes, diamonds aren't only gems; they're also used in industry. Um, it is my understanding that. Um, um, 
the natural diamonds, the mines that you actually mine, are almost exclusively gems now, less so 10 years ago, but that now actually uh, synthetic diamonds have improved to the extent that almost all industrial diamonds are now synthetic ones. Um, um, yeah, I think you, 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 you raise a number of points, um, and, and a lot of them go back to saying, well, there, there's a lot behind this conflict in Sierra Leone, right? Many things, you can, you can spend a lifetime studying this country and this situation. Absolutely true. And with my research, uh, being an economist, we're very good at zooming in on one particular thing and making really sure it's there, and then not sort of, you know, I hesitate to say ignore, but at least not focus on anything else. Um, um, but I don't mean at all to suggest that me focusing on one particular relationship means that all these other things aren't going on. I think they absolutely are. Um, uh, coerced recruitment, violence, uh, uh, um, uh, rebels being uh, uh, engaging in violence against the population. I think, well, my reason wouldn't be at all inconsistent between both saying diamonds both spur violence against the local population, but then also diamonds can provide income for people. These two things I don't think are mutually exclusive at all. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that covers okay. most of the points we're, that we're I've We're gonna take one anyway. final question and there was a hand, a gentleman at the back there. Hi, thanks very much. I'm Rob Morris from Oxford Policy Management, and thanks for the talk. Um, I'm interested in the second of the causal mechanisms that you set out uh, around the relationship between um, uh, diamonds and conflict uh, via livelihoods. And in one of the challenges in the econometric literature, as I understand on this, is the assumption that um, you're either a rebel or you're doing like, productive livelihoods, and it's a kind of an either or. Um, but there are a number of mediating factors that might you know, actually challenge that assumption. So one of which is the seasonality of, of, of livelihoods and labor and the seasonality of war, on the other hand, of opportunities for violence. And then second are the organizational um, structures of, uh, of um, armed groups. So, you know, in, in some organizations, you're able to both be a rebel and also be a farmer, and that's fine. Um, so I was wondering uh, if your research or the broader literature has taken into account these these mediating factors in understanding that that relationship between violent, uh, between diamonds and and conflict. Thanks. Um, yes, I think that's you. You raised several very good points here. Um, basically, all saying lines aren't that clear. Uh, the line between rebel and minor isn't clear in Sierra Leone. Yeah, the, 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 the line between being a rebel soldier or a government soldier was very, very blurred. Uh, people can be a farmer in, in, in some seasons and then mine in others. I think that is very, very common. Um, um, the organizational structure of armed groups differs. Um, yes, all true. I think it does help us though. These issues are also complicated. It can help us to say, okay, conceptually, we think about it as a rebel, a minor, and a government soldier, say, and we see sort of how actors move between these roles. And we're talking about sort of the extent to which they are in here or the extent to which they are in there. Because yes, you can be a minor and a farm at the same time, but of course it matters whether you're farming 11 months of the year and you're a minor one, or you're farming one month of the year and you're a minor for 11. And the same sort of goes for rebels, et cetera. So I think just may, me making these hard distinctions is a way to conceptually make things clear and to conceptually think about it. But if we're really thinking about the entire Sierra Leonean population, yes, this is a very, very fluid thing to do. Um, I think you were also asking um, whether I can investigate sort of these mediators econometrically. Um, of course, the easy out is saying, oh, this analysis includes country fixed effects, year fixed effects at the sub-country level. It includes country year trends and cell fixed effects. Just so to the extent that these mediators are fixed um, and don't change, uh, et cetera, et cetera, for differently, differently for different fixed effects, these won't influence the analysis. Whether I can really investigate it, not really. The only thing that I can investigate is whether um, economic activity in a particular area with secondary diamonds goes up if the diamond price goes up. 
and we can we're, we're aided by this by uh, uh, nightlight data. So basically thinking that if an area lights up more at night, there is more economic activity going on there. And you can see um, in support of my second causal mechanism that if the price of diamond goes up, uh, the nightlight emitted by the area of secondary diamonds goes up, but also by all sort of block cells around it, and then by the cells that are adjacent to the cell that are adjacent to the cell that has the secondary diamond. So it goes up in two ways. So that is really the only sort of mediating factor that I can really investigate. Okay, so, well, thank you very much, Anouk. You've introduced us to many layers of complexity, um, particularly those of us who um, owe their entire knowledge on this topic to Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, I, before we close, I would like to introduce, uh, sorry, I'd like to let you know about um, just a few more upcoming events. In this series, The Nature of Conflict, next week, same time, same place, we have Professor Cleany Rally um, from the University of Sussex talking about climate violence and the intersection of climate change um, and um, the possibility of violence. And the following Thursday, we have Professor Gunnar Sorbo from uh, the Mikkelsen Institute in Norway on food security and conflict. Um, changing tack completely, if on Monday you're in the mood for some conceptual thinking, we have Professor Brian Enquist, who is an Oxford Martin visiting fellow from the University of Arizona, who will be talking about the concept of time in biology and the unity of life. Um, and he's looking at physiological time, um, so the functioning of ecosystems, the diversity of life, and how um, um, basically the significant characteristics of life and helps that unites the study of biology. So that promises to be a very interesting talk. And also another um, one, last one that I want to draw your attention to on the 17th of May, here at five o'clock, um, we have Dr. Molly Crockett, who's professor of experimental psychology, talking about moral outrage in the digital age. So a variety of topics is always here. And so perhaps we could just close with one last thank you for Anouk. <laughs>